friends of mine from the Anchor Point area, the Wood family, and we're delighted that they're here today. And uh, I want you to make sure you welcome them. Dan, wave, wave your hand so they know where you're at. Dan and Amy and Mac right there. Mac uh, was my assistant basketball coach for several years down in Anchor Point. And uh, we had a lot of fun together with the kids. So it's an honor for me to have them here today with me. Nehemiah. Turn to Nehemiah. We're going to begin or continue our series today. Last week we began a series in Nehemiah entitled, Being Rebuilt to Become Rebuilders. And that is the heart of God for each and every one of us. We need to remember that God's desire is to restore our lives, to make us healthy and whole and strong spiritually, physically, mentally, in every way. God's plan is for us to be whole. Amen? Nehemiah is an awesome picture of the Holy Spirit coming and rebuilding a life. Are you thankful for that? God wants to rebuild your life. And don't tell me that there are not areas that you have struggled with where brokenness comes. We live in a fallen world that is constantly trying to tear us down and break us apart. And when those things happen in our lives, we can look to the Lord because He is our Restorer. Amen? We're going to begin uh, at verse 1 of chapter 2 today, and we're going to read through verse 10. And then we're going to go through these verses and look at some specific things. But read along with me, if you will, today. Verse 1, chapter 2 of Nehemiah. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must per permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and for the household that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I went to the governor in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sandal the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. I love that last part. The enemy was deeply disturbed because a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Father, we thank You for Your Word today. We ask that You allow it to be applied to our lives. That when we leave this service today, our hearts will have been changed. We will have been transformed more into the likeness of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Being rebuilt and becoming rebuilders. There's two pictures that we talked about last week in Nehemiah that speak to us very powerfully. Two pictures. The first picture is a picture of Nehemiah as the Old Testament example of the Holy Spirit of God. Nehemiah's name means comforter of God or consolation of God. And Nehemiah is an Old Testament picture of how the Holy Spirit has a desire to come and to rebuild our lives. There is not a life, there is not a broken person that our God cannot heal. 
that He cannot restore. It doesn't matter what you've gone through. It doesn't matter the turmoil. It doesn't matter how broken you feel you are today. I want to assure you, our God can transform your life. Do you believe that today? I hope that you're open to that. Because God isn't through with you yet. He still wants to work in your life. Amen? Do we have any perfect people here today? I really want to see. Do we have anybody that's perfect here today? Has, it, has anybody ever found a perfect church? If you did and you joined, it wouldn't be perfect. Amen? We're not perfect, but we have a perfect Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. We have a perfect Holy Spirit that will come and rebuild our lives. Now, the second picture that we talked about last week is that Nehemiah is a picture of a kind of person. He is a picture of a kind of person that has the heart of God that wants to see lives restored. He sees the brokenness around him, and he does everything he can, not counting the cost to himself personally. And that's important. He's not counting what it's going to cost me. He's focused on how can I be used to rebuild lives. And that is a picture of Nehemiah that we need to apply in our lives. First of all, Holy Spirit, come and restore and rebuild me. Second of all, Holy Spirit, give me a heart that no matter what the cost, I am going to see lives rebuilt, transformed, and changed for the kingdom of God. I love that picture of Nehemiah. And I believe God is calling us to be that church. God's calling us to be a church that is filled with Nehemiahs. Amen? Because God doesn't only want to restore you just to bless you and have you restored. He wants to partner with you in the rebuilding of other lives. Church, spiritually, we live in a valley whose broken down walls and gates have been burned with fire. Amen? Spiritually, we live in a broken community where families are being destroyed, where families are being torn apart, where uh, young people are hurting and children are hurting and adults are lonely and hurting. There's people who have had, because of circumstances in this world, things they've gone through and attacks of the enemy and making mistakes and committing sin, their lives have become broken and beaten down and burned with fire and church. God's calling, watch the assembly of God to be a Nehemiah church. Now, who will join me and say, I want to be that church? I want to be that church. Now, there's two verses that will help us to understand, and I want us to see, it's a famous verse, we all know it, it's Jeremiah 29, 11. All of us that love that verse, all of us that probably had that verse quoted to us when we were going through difficult times. But the Lord says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. God has thoughts solely about you. Now listen, thoughts of peace and not of evil. God's thoughts towards you are good thoughts to give you a future and a hope. A future and a hope. God has calculated, designed plans for your future that's different from the calculations, the thoughts, the plans, the ideas that God has for the future of anybody else. God has specific calculated thoughts and plans for your future, church. Oh, come on. Last week we talked about the fact that God in, engraved our names upon His, on, upon His palm, upon His hand. He cares about us. We're in His thoughts. And this verse says that God has specific plans for your future. Never worry about your future. God says, I've already got it worked out and planned. Oh, come on, church. Some of us need to hear that. 
We're living in stressful times. We have a debt that is escalated as the nation that's probably going to cause us to implode. There are people that are living in fear and in stress. And they don't, they're worried about what's going to take place economically. I heard somebody the other day talking about China, and that China is in worse shape than we are. And, and if China falls, that it's going to be a domino effect, and there's going to be a worldwide economy that's just going to collapse. There's lots of things like that that can bring fear into your heart, but God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. And when you understand that you have a planned future that God has designed specifically for you, you go along and you say, I've got a feeling that the thing's going to be all right. Amen? It doesn't matter what the future holds. God's got it planned out. He hasn't lost the recipe to make manna so you're not going to starve. Now, Everything could collapse. I would, don't doubt that. There's a lot of bad things going on in our world. But I know who holds my tomorrow. I know who has my future planned out. He says, Mill, I have plans specifically for you, ideas and thoughts that are just for you. Don't worry about your future. I've got it all under control. I like that. Amen? Now, there's a partner verse that we don't think about in that same chapter of Jeremiah 29. And I want us to look at that. It's verse 7. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. Now that's hard for us to do, isn't it? What we need to realize is God gave this prophecy to Israel during the time that Jerusalem was being destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. This is 150 years before Nehemiah, and God is assuring the people, I've got your future planned out. You don't need to worry. There is a hope-filled future for you. But we fail to remember this promise was given in the midst of circumstances all around them when it looked like everything was falling apart, everything was collapsing, Jerusalem was being sacked, it was being destroyed, Nebuchadnezzar's heart's desire was to destroy it to the uttermost where that not one stone could be placed upon another where they wouldn't have any way they could ever rebuild it. And it was in those circumstances God is telling them when, when it's natural to look around at your problems and everything that you're facing, when everything is difficult, when everything looks its worst, don't keep your eyes on your problems. Keep your focus on me. And the purpose in which I have placed you there. Now think about that, church. God says, when you're carried away in captivity, they had sinned against God, they had failed, their forefathers had sinned and worshipped in, in idolatry, they turned from the living God, and because of that, they were allowed to go into captivity. But God says, I've carried you away. He's saying, I'm still in control. I allowed this to happen. But I have a purpose for you being in the city where you are. And you need to take your focus off of your problems. Get your focus on the purpose I have brought you there. And that is to be a blessing to that city. God has planted you here to be a blessing to the valley. To be a blessing to Alaska to be a blessing to the United States of America. God has placed us here, and our focus isn't to be, oh me, oh my, what am I going through? But it's, God, what can I do to be used of you to make a difference where you planted me? How hard would it have been to pray for your captors? They had taken them into captivity. They were enslaving those people, and God said, you pray for them. Pray that I'll bless their city. Pray for peace in that city. Why? When, when, when 
when we take our focus off of our problems that we're facing and we begin to pray for sometimes even our enemies, God does a work in our lives. And it's powerful. Amen? Pray for the peace of that city. Pray for the peace of those people. Because in their peace, you're going to be you're going to receive blessing. You're going to receive that peace as well. Amen? Isn't that powerful, church? Now remember that Nehemiah, Nehemiah was removed from these people. He didn't have to do what he did. And I want us to look at several things today. Now, we're not supposed to pretend that things are tough, are we? When they're uh, pretend that they're not tough when they are. Amen? We're not supposed to be ostriches. We're not supposed to walk around and say, Oh, I don't like the things. I'm going to stick my head in the sand. Right? And say, Oh, things are good. Things are good. Things are good. No. God doesn't call us to, to say that, 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 that we're not having issues or to pretend that they're not. But our focus is to be on Him. He's greater than our problems, greater than our issue. He will bring us through. Amen? Now, there's three things I want us to see today. First of all, it's the availability. Second of all, it's commitment. And third, it's resources. We need all three of those things. The first two have to do with decisions that we make. Are we going to be available? Are we going to be committed? And the third has to do with resources, and God is in charge of the resources. He's the one that provides the resources. So let's go through this and, and uh, look at these today. First of all, in verse 1, we're, we're going to look at, a, at a, availability. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the year 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, that I took wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Nehemiah was so moved with compassion that it changed his countenance, and he couldn't remove the burden that was on his heart. And I want to ask you, have you ever had a burden like that? Have you ever had a burden for someone else? Where your countenance, people, you just walk into the room and they say, what's wrong? I can tell, I can sense there's something that's on your heart. There's something that's, that's disturbing you. What is it? Nehemiah, three or three to four months had gone by, and he hadn't forgotten about the people who were hurting and living in brokenness. So many times we get caught up in our own lives, and it's so easy for us to forget about those that are hurting, those that are needy, those that are broken. Amen? Nehemiah didn't forget, and he made himself available. He was available. Church, have you ever made yourself available to God? It starts with making yourself available to God. God wants to know that you're available. Amen? You start with saying, Lord, I welcome you into my life. I want you to be part of my life. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from my sins. Lord, I want to partner with you. I want your plan. Years ago, years ago, on a, on a Saturday afternoon, I was taking a break from studying for Sunday sermon, and Melinda, the kids were all real small, and, and Melinda had taken the kids. She's such a wonderful wife. She, she knew I needed some quiet time to study and prepare and pray for Sunday. So she took the kids and went to the park or something and got entertained them while I had quiet time. Well, I've been praying and studying, and I sat down for a break, and and I flipped on the TV, and a documentary came on TV about a missionary in Alaska who was traveling from village to village in the interior on a snow machine. And I thought, how unique. How interesting. I'm going to sit down and watch this for a while. And so I sat down and I began to watch that. And while I was watching it, the Holy Spirit filled the room. I felt an overwhelming presence of God as I watched. Tears began to fill my eyes. And on that day, at that moment, that I'll never forget, I said, God, I'll go if you want me to go. I said, Lord, I'm available. I had no hesitation 
I, had, I didn't know a person in Alaska. I had never been to Alaska. I didn't have any contacts into Alaska. I didn't know anything about Alaska other than what I'd heard or read and studied, you know, in school. I didn't know a lot about the state, but I knew one thing. I knew that God's presence filled that room and that He gave me a burden for the state of Alaska. And I said, Lord, here I am. I didn't tell Melinda, but I said, Lord, here I am. <laughs> Actually, she did come home, and I said, honey, you're not going to believe this. I said, I was watching a documentary on TV, and I said, it was about Alaska and, and a missionary traveling from on a snow machine and going to a little village church and and starting a wood stove, and it was like minus 40 degrees. People came to church, and he had it up to about 20 degrees in there. And I said, honey, you're not going to believe this. And I said, I feel like God's calling us to life. She goes, I don't think so. You just want to go hunting and fishing. And I said, no, honey. I said, God's calling us to Alaska. He said, we don't know anybody in Alaska. We've never been there. How on earth are we going to get there? I said, I don't know and I don't care. I'm just saying, yes, Lord, if that's where you want us to go, we're going to go. It took several more weeks before God convinced Melinda. She said, one day she, she was praying in the afternoon, and she said, Lord, if you really want us to go to Alaska, have Joy call me. Joy was a friend of ours who was a missionary who traveled all over the world, and anywhere there were large populations of Jewish people, and and she would minister in Israel, minister in Russia, any place there was a lot of Jewish people. We didn't have any idea where she was, and we hadn't heard from her in, in probably months or more, possibly longer. But Melinda prayed that prayer, and then she thought, oh, Lord, why did I pray that? Have you ever done that? That's a silly prayer, Lord. Or, you know, why did I pray that? Ten minutes later, Joy calls her from the other side of the world, and she said, I'm sorry I couldn't call you ten minutes ago. God told me to, but I was in a meeting. From the other side of the world, Joy says, what's going on? God told me to call you. After that, I had no more problems. She knew we were going to Alaska. She said, okay, here we go, Lord. We didn't know how we were going to do it, we, but we made that commitment. Lord, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. Lord, I just want to be in your will. I want to be a restorer of souls. I want to restore lives. Wherever you open the door, Lord, I want to run through it with my arms wide open, saying, Jesus is the answer. Nehemiah was moved with compassion. He didn't give up. He made himself available. In verse 2, it was disrespectful in ancient times to be sad in the presence of the king. It was something you did not do. Why? Because it meant there was something on your mind that you thought was more important than the king. And nothing was more important than the king. That's why he says, I was dreadfully afraid. Why? Because he was living in a monarchy where the king could be upset or he could, he could be, you know, to the point he could be so upset he could stay off with your head. So he was dreadfully afraid, but he made that commitment. In verse 3, he comes up and he says, May the king live forever! If you're ever in this situation and you've offended the king, that's a good phrase to use. May the king live forever! He was snapped back into reality, into the protocol. He knew he had made a mistake, and he was trying to make amends for it. Oh, king, live forever! Oh. Why? Because he knew that his life could be taken. He knew that he had messed up. But he was shot back, and he recognizes something is happening. I want you to see this. He recognizes in verse 3 that something is happening. Look. And he said to the king, may the king live forever. But then he goes on and listens to what he says. He takes the opportunity. Why should my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? 
He took the opportunity. He recognized in verse 8, we noticed something. It says that he recognized that the hand of God was upon him. So he recognizes that God is in this. God's moving. So he takes the step of faith and he steps out and he makes the king knowledgeable of what's going on. Now, 25 years later, after Nehemiah, we see another example of this because Nehemiah had no right, no, no way legally to bring his agenda to the king. He, he didn't have, even though he, he was a right-hand man for the king, so to speak, a, an informal advisor to the king, a cabinet position, if you will, in his day. Even though he had that position, he didn't have the right to bring his request to the king. Esther didn't have that right, even though Esther, the Bible tells us, was the beloved queen. And what, what did she say in chapter 4, verse 16 of Esther? She says, so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. It's the same situation, and yet Nehemiah understood God was working in the situation. Aren't you thankful that even when you don't see, God is behind the scenes, He's always working on your behalf. I like that. God's grace opened the door, and He recognized that. In verse 4, the king could have said, don't bother me, leave me, get out of here, I don't want to have anything to do with this, off with your head. But what happens? God is working. God is working. And look at the end of verse 4. It says, so I pray to the God of heaven. Now, I want us to look at that for just a second. How did Nehemiah do that? Did he say, oh king, excuse me, pardon me, hold on a minute. I need to pray. Heavenly Father, would you give me advice and wisdom? No! No! He simply, it's one of those internal little quick prayers, God help me. Amen? Aren't you thankful that God hears those little quick internal prayers? Amen? God give me wisdom right now. God give me blood. Give me favor in this situation. God help me to say the right thing. We do it all the time in church. I want you to know it may not be a long, drawn-out, lengthy prayer, a formal prayer, but church, God hears and answers those little prayers. He cares about you. He cares about the things you're facing. And when you're in a business meeting, when you're on the job, when you're struggling at home, and you say, Jesus, He hears you. So he prayed, Lord, help me in this situation. And look at verse 6. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. I love that. I set him a time. That's commitment, church. That's the next point I want us to see. Too many times we make ourselves available, but when it comes down to the nitty-gritty moment when we have to say, God, I'm all in it for you. I'm 100% going to live for you. I'm going to do what you call me to do. Go where you want me to go. So many times we kind of start back. Church, I want us to see a church here at Wasilla Assembly that is a Nehemiah church in our commitment to God. Amen. I didn't come to play church. I didn't come here for, for to just have a, a, a little good time on Sunday and fellowship and, and, and to shake a few hands and encourage people and smile and be, be happy. I want a genuine presence of the living God in this place. I want people who are committed to God, 100% sold out, saying, God, I'm all yours. Years ago, I had a lady. She was so afraid God was going to call her to some far-off, remote part of the world where she'd have to live in a hut. She was. She was so afraid of it that she wouldn't make that commitment to God. She would come to church. She would be faithful and do other things. But when it came right down to saying, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go and do what you want me to do, she backed off and said, I just can't quite do that. Church, I want you to know, wherever God sends you, you're going to have the grace and not only endure it, but you're going to enjoy it. Amen? 
And another thing, there were people that told me when I, I told them I was called to Alaska, we were going to go to Alaska, they said, well, what about your kids? What about your kids? What about the schooling? You know, I, at the time I was in, in uh, Arlington, Texas School District, which was the top school district, the very well-educated education program, and you, we were sure that the kids would have a real good education. And people said, well, you don't know what you're getting into. I said, I don't know what I'm getting into, but I know my God is able. Amen? I'm not worried about it. My, God's not going to let my kids be hurt because of my calling when I'm 100% called to Him. You can trust Him, church. And it's time that we said, yes, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go and do what you want me to do. Lord, I want to be a Nehemiah wherever you send me. Amen? And God has brought some of you here. Some of you have stayed here when times were difficult. You weathered storms. And there were times that you could have left. And God's going to honor that commitment. Amen? God's going to restore. God's going to rebuild. God's going to work through your life. Hey, church, God's got great things in plan, and plan for, ahead for our future. Do you believe that? I do. Another thing I want you to see, he set him a time, 12 years. 12 years, church. I didn't say 12 months. I said 12 years. That's commitment. There's something else I want us to see. The number 12 in the Bible has to do with divine government. And I'm not going to push this point, but I want you to think about it. By establishing the number 12, 12 years, I think Nehemiah was praying, Lord, I want a complete restoration of divine government in Israel. I want God to rule. Amen? That's commitment. Commitment to seeing it totally, completely restored. And I want you to join me today and say, Lord, that's our heart right here in Wasilla Assembly today. We want divine rule. We want the authority, the power, the kingdom rule of God in this place, in our lives, and ruling through Wasilla Assembly to spread the rule of God through the valley and through this state. I want to see leaders raised up. I want to see young people raised up and going out and becoming youth pastors in other churches. I want to see young people being raised up and going out to the villages, going out to be missionaries around the world. I want to be a part of what God is doing in the last days. I want to be a church of Nehemiah that's totally committed. God will go where you call us to go. In verse 7, Nehemiah asked for something else. He asked for authority. Furthermore, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. He needed authority to get the job done. He needed authority to get through the boundaries that were between him and Jerusalem. And there were governors there that did not want to see the city rebuilt because they didn't want to lose their control in the lives of the people. So he needed authority. And what happened? The king provided the authority. Church, I want you to know the Bible tells us something about authority. It says Jesus has all authority and all power in heaven and earth. He is the ultimate authority, church. And the Bible also says that when we were commissioned to go out, that we are going out in that power and in that authority. In Mark chapter 16, in the Great Commission, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. Then He says, in my name, they will cast out demons and they will speak with new tongues. They will take up the serpents and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. All of it comes 
through the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. We have been given the authority through the name of the King. Oh, come on, church. We've been given all the authority that we need to pass through every boundary. You see, every demon flee and every power of hell broken. You have the authority of the King because you are a believer. You are a child of the King today. There's nothing He can't restore. There's nothing He can't work through your life to see someone else restored. Amen? Oh, come on, church. I know you like authority. And we have all the authority we need in our King. In verse 8, Nehemiah also asked for resources. And I want us to see something powerful here. First of all, he makes himself available. Then he's totally committed to the cause. And then is when the Lord provides the resources. So many times, we have it backwards. We say, Lord, provide all the resources and maybe I'll make myself available and maybe I'll be committed. Huh? It's right. You know it's right. God's looking for those who will make a way, who will say, Lord, I'm available, Lord, I'm committed, but Lord, you provide the resources. I was telling you a moment ago about Melinda and myself and how we we made that commitment to the Lord. We began to pray. Well, something amazing happened. I told you at the time, I didn't know anyone in Alaska. I didn't have any connections with any churches, any pastors. Never heard of anybody that had been to Alaska didn't, didn't know anything about it. All I did know was that God was calling us to Alaska, and Melinda had joined me in the in the in the commitment. We needed a new car really bad, and so I went out and bought a four-wheel drive Jeep Cherokee. And my mom, I came home, and my mom said, "What on earth did you buy that for?" I said, "Because I'm going to Alaska." Sure. Really encouraging, sure. sure. Melinda had just graduated with a degree, and it was a teaching degree, but it was a specialized degree, and it was a kind of an unknown degree. It was called uh, Human and Learning Development. And so she began to look for a job in the Fort Worth, Dallas area, and she was looking through the paper, and she came across. An ad in looking for a degree, and then there was a, a, an, an ad that said, We're looking for someone with a degree in human and learning development. And Melinda said, Wow, here's somebody that's asking for my degree. And it had an 800 number, and so it scared her. So she set it aside for about two weeks, continued to look for a job, couldn't find a job teaching anywhere. And finally, she said, okay, Lord, I'm going to call it. She called the 800 number. It was the Kodiak Baptist Mission in Kodiak, Alaska. I'll never forget that day. I had the biggest smile on my face. I said, that's how God's going to get us to Alaska. (laughs) So she called it. They they flew us up. They hired us to be teaching parents in the, the girls' home there in the mission in Kodiak, Alaska. And and so, church, there's a message there. God has your future planned. He strategically designed everything to fit together. And you don't have to worry about your future. All you have to do is make sure you're available and committed to the purpose and plan of God. He has all the resources. They paid to ship our stuff up. They flew our family up. They took every care of everything. And they thought they were doing it for them. And God had other plans. Yes, we did our best, and we we worked with the kids in the home, and thank God there are still kids that went through the program that are in church, raising their kids in church today, and we were able to have an influence in their life. But God brought us up there, starting a great new adventure, and it was all in His plan. He had it planned out. Why? Because we were available and committed 100%, and then God supplied the resources. Church, whatever resource you need, God has it. Amen. You say, "Well, I want to be in ministry, but but I'm I'm just not a I'm just not cut out for it." I've heard that. In fact, I heard that from my mom and my dad, and they're they're listening today, and I'm going to nail them. 
When I told my mom, I said, Mom, you're not going to believe this. God's called me into the ministry. She goes, Oh, son, you don't have the personality to be a preacher. You're too quiet. You're too shy. You know, you're, you're just not. I don't think so. My dad, he was real encouraging. He said, Oh, son, you're going to starve to death. He was a lot closer. <laughs> Sometimes we don't get the encouragement that we're looking for. But church, when you know that you know that you know, God told me to do this. I'm available. I'm committed. God will supply everything that you need. Amen? Growing up in school, I was a kid always on the back row. I never wanted to be in front of people. I never wanted to speak. I was always quiet. I never wanted to give a report. I just wanted to get the work done and get out of class and go play ball. Some of you can relate to that. And it was a stretch. And I'll tell you, when God called me into the ministry, it was a stretch for me. Because I, even after, after I got out of school, I wanted to be the businessman that made a lot of money that supported missions and supported the church. That's who I wanted to be. I did a friend, Randy McPherson. We were joking a couple of months ago. We went moose hunting and... and uh, Randy was laughing and I was laughing because he was giving his life story, you know, and he, he said, he looked at me and he said, Milk, he said, I grew up and I wanted to be you and you grew up and you were wanting to be me. He said, I wanted to be the preacher, now I'm the businessman. <laughs> God has a plan, amen, and he has the resources and he can mold you and make you into what he has called you to be, amen, and I am thankful. The very first time I, I began to preach, I'll never forget it. You know, after I had the overwhelming encouragement from my father and my mother. Oh, son, you'll starve to death. Oh, son, you're too mild and meek, quiet, you can't preach. You don't have a personality for it. I'll never forget it. I stood up there and I preached, and my mom and my dad, both of them, they had this look. And after church, they, they came up, my mom said, son, that wasn't you. I said, I know it, it wasn't all of Jesus. <laughs> he, re- he gives us what we need. He supplies the resources. Amen? You can be a Nehemiah because God is your resource. God is our resource to build this church. God is our resource. And we are a church of Nehemiahs that hunger for God. We want to see people restored. We want to see the valley restored. We want to see Alaska restored. We want to see revival. Amen? Is there anybody in here committed to revival besides me? Amen. I want you to stand with me. The provincial governor's didn't want to see the city rebuilt. They wanted to do everything in their control, in their power to prevent it. But I love this last verse. Sanballat and Tobiah were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. The church, I want to tell you today, God called a man that has a heart and seeks the well-being of Wasilla Assembly in the valley and in the state of life. And I want you to join me and be a rebuilder. I want you to join me and say, Lord, I'm available. Lord, I'm committed. And Lord, you just have to supply me. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the picture of Nehemiah and how that Nehemiah is a picture of your Holy Spirit. And right now, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would move across this place. 
that your Holy Spirit would begin to rebuild the areas of our lives that have been broken down. Maybe there's areas that we do not even realize that have suffered heartache or damage has been broken. Lord, I pray that you would show us those areas and bring the healing and the restoration. And Lord, I pray that like Nehemiah, we wouldn't be concerned about the cost to ourselves, that we would see a world that's broken, see a world whose walls are torn down and whose gates are burned with fire. And we would say, Lord, I want to be in the Nehemiah with you. I want to be in the Nehemiah. Lord, fill this church with your Holy Spirit's rebuilding power. And fill this church with people that want to partner with you to bring restoration in. Lord, fill your church in that. Lord, we ask it in. I want to ask the 